Okay, so somebody asked the question, can Christians be demonized? Can a Christian be possessed by a demon? And so, I mean, the short answer is a Christian who's been born again by the Holy Spirit cannot be possessed in the sense that they are owned by Satan, that they're owned by a demon. They're not owned. Um, but if the word by the word possess, we mean can they be heavily influenced? Can they be demonized? Can they be influenced in such a way that it is within the nature and complexity of the human person? Yes. And so one of the problems with this, and I want to focus in on on one specific thing that that I hear people a lot of times say, like, oh, a Christian, if, if a person has demons in the sense that like they can manifest and have a demon speaking through them, or they're being assaulted physically, or, um, you know, they're getting some kind of demonic dreams or any of these kind of things, then there are unfortunately plenty of Christian pastors and leaders who would say that a person, um, a lot of times they would say, well, this person is not saved. And I think the idea is, I think their intention may be good, but the problem with that is now you're telling a person who loves the Lord, who fully believes in the Lord, who's doing their best to walk faithfully with Christ, and yet they have a problem, and these people are essentially saying, you're not saved yet, you have a false Jesus, or you're still living in sin. And that's a real it's a real harm, um, it, you know, ultimately, and yes, if they have a false Jesus. So there's always the potential that a person's not saved if they're struggling. And a lot of times in, in our ministry, we get people who, who do have a faulty understanding of who God is or of who Christ is or what happened on the cross, or they're not sanctifying their life. They're not repenting of their sin. They're not changing their lifestyle. And so there's all of these things. And there's, so there's some, there's some truth to that. But that's not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The reality is that human beings are complex and that we, the part of us that is born again is our spirit nature. And the part where demons would be is primarily in the soul, which is the mind, the will, the emotions, right? So, and this is so. This is the area where demons are embedded. It's where they get that foothold or that stronghold that we talked about earlier. And so, one of the verses that I'm going to look at two of them because this, um, and unfortunately, this is so this is my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are saying these things. Um. This is, there's two verses commonly that, that, that Christians commonly go to as an example of scripture saying that a born again Christian cannot have a demon still in them because, and they'll say things like, well, do you think the Holy Spirit's going to have a demon as a roommate or live in the same house with him? And no and Yes. He won't be in the same exact place, so I agree with that, but the human person is complex, and there's different areas of our humanity that are still open to demonic influence and demonic presence, for lack of a better word. The, the demon has access to our life, and so one of the verses that that's quoted is second Corinthians six. And I'm going to read from verse 14. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. What accord does Christ with Balal or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever what agreement has the temple of god with idols 
for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So is this saying that a Christian can't have a demon? For, for one, it... It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Does that mean it's impossible to be equally yoked, to be yoked with, a, with an unbeliever? Of course not. It's not saying it's impossible to be yoked with an unbeliever. It's saying it is possible, therefore don't let it happen. <laughs> so this very passage that Christians use to say it can't happen, it's saying it can happen, but it's not good that it happens, so don't let it happen. So should a Christian be okay with demons living in them? No, it's not good. Don't let it happen. Don't let it, it it's not good. It's not God's will, so it's not our will. But that's not to say it can't happen. It says, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Right? And the answer is none. If you want to be righteous, don't be lawless. What fellowship does light have with darkness? None. So if you want to live in the light, stop living in the darkness. What accord has Christ with Bilal? None. So if you follow Christ wholeheartedly, don't follow Bilal or any of the other demons. Right? So what agreement has the temple of God with idols? None. So get rid of your idols. <laughs> So every one of these points is not saying it cannot happen. It's saying it should not happen. It says, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them, walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. God comes to live in us. We're born again. Our spirit nature is born of the Holy Spirit. He says, therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from all them says the lord and touch no unclean thing and then i will welcome you so do we need to get rid of every form of sin every form of brokenness every form of demon and separate ourselves from them and touch no unclean thing and then be welcomed by god no what we need to do is repent and say, I no longer want this stuff in my life. I no longer choose to follow after it and serve it. And I put my trust in Jesus. It is through faith in Jesus that we are justified and made whole and restored in our relationship with God and the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. It is not us separating from all this other stuff, fixing ourselves up first and then going to Jesus. It's us repenting, saying, I don't want this other stuff. We go to Jesus. He gives us the ability to overcome all of these other things, right? And so it even says here, touch no unclean thing. That, you know, this is quoting, this is a reference to the Old Testament law where they weren't allowed to touch things that would make them unclean, and therefore they could not go into the temple and sacrifice to God. We are not... Under the law right now, Christ has fulfilled the law for us. And so there are areas of our life that will be dealt with after salvation, not before salvation. And so a lot of times this is used to say, you know, Christians can't be, um, you know, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We can't have demons. If we picture the temple the Old Testament temple, you have a, um, you have a, you have the little small area called the Holy of Holies where God's presence was. Within that, or that was within a larger area called the Holy Place, which was where only priests could go into. And then within that, you have the larger courtyard area where the animal sacrifice would happen, where people could come in and participate as the priest. They basically were there. They prayed. They put their hands on the head of the animal to sort of symbolize that this animal is going to die for, for my sins. 
And it's this, this, the human person, uh, I believe it's first Thessalonians five twenty three, says that humans are body, soul, and spirit. We are the temple of the living God. Yes, but we are body, soul, and spirit. And this is not a coincidence that it relates to this temple of God, which was an outer courtyard where an an, a sin, you know, where sinful human could go into and this animal who would bear the consequences of the sin would get slaughtered in that area and its blood would, you know, and then bef- then they would go into a holy place where only priests could go into and then there was a smaller room within that separated by a large curtain called the Holy of Holies. It was the most holy place. The presence of God was there. The Ark of the Covenant was there. And only one person could go in this room. It was the most, there was the high priest and he could only go in one day of the year on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And he had to do sacrifices on behalf of himself and, and put blood on himself and go in in this state of blamelessness covered by the blood in order to be in there. And they used to tie a rope around their waist uh, it, just in case they sinned in the presence of God and they dropped dead. <laughs> and so if they heard the thud, then they in the other room would just pull the rope and, and you know, drag the, the body out. And so the human temple is like this. We're born again. The Holy Spirit lives in our most holy place. Our spirit is born again. The, the second area is kind of like our soul. It's our mind, our will, our emotions. It's the rest of us that makes us who we are. It's the unique part of the human person. And if a demon is going to be there, it's going to be in this area of the person, not in our spirit, but in our soul. Or in the outer courtyard area, which is sort of comparable to the body, the human body. And so it says, it does not say a demon cannot be there. It says it should not be there. And I agree, it should not be there. And so if we have demons, then we need to get rid of them. We need to get rid of them. It is God's temple. They are trespassing on his property. They do need to be removed. It's God's will that they are removed as quickly as possible. And so the reason why they aren't is usually through it's, it's a delay in our own pursuit of our own sanctification. That's usually slowing down the progress. It's not that God doesn't want it to happen sooner because God wants it to happen as soon as it can happen. And so, um, yeah. And so it's, this this verse is not saying that that we cannot have darkness in our life. It's saying it, we should not have darkness in our life. And you know the same people who say, "See, it says you can't have." It says what? It also says that of fruitless deeds or of sin. Can a born again Christian still sin? Yes. Should they? No. <laughs> Can a can a born again person still have faults, wrong thinking? Yes. Should they? No. Can they still have wounds from childhood that haven't been healed yet? Yes. Should they? No. <laughs> so this is this is not. So we just need to accurately understand and interpret these things. And if we look at this r- rightly, the scripture it doesn't lead us to the conclusion that all Christians, once we become born again, we automatically get instantly delivered, instantly healed, instantly glorified because that's not the truth. We don't get instantly. Now, sometimes God does a miraculous work and people do get delivered of a bunch of stuff or healed. And that's amazing when it happens, but it's by no means guaranteed. And a lot of people don't experience total transformation overnight. And so, we, we are set free from the biggest thing, which is, you know, the, the fact that our spirit wasn't born again and we're dead in our sins and trespasses and we're going to go to hell. We're separated from God and we're going to die. We are saved from all of that immediately, but it's these other areas that sometimes can take some time. And so we do need to be committed to that process. Um, and, you know, 
let me read one other verse. Uh, this is in First John. Um, let's see, First John one five. It says, I'm gonna skip the first half of the verse. It says, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So it says if we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's, we don't get saved and then we're instantly cleansed of all unrighteousness, instantly cleansed of everything that's dark. We need to be committed to walking in the light. And if we do walk in the light, it says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So we commit to walking in the light and he cleanses us from our sin. And I would argue, as well as any demonic thing, any dark bondage that we are still having, he cleanses us. He removes that from us. It says, um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we commit to that process and he helps and he helps us in that. All right. Um, looking at the chat. Uh, Sarah says, I never thought of a comparison that way to the tabernacle. Yep, and there's and there's actually a bunch of other really cool parallels. Um, I talk about it and I show pictures and diagrams and stuff uh, and even some custom graphics that I created in the Spiritual Warfare Bootcamp class, which I plan on doing a live teaching of uh, in the near future. And then I will ultimately uh, record those and put them and put them uh, in the membership program so that way everyone will have a copy for it as well. 